Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you'd like to get two additional bonus live streams per month, extra long, two and a half to three hours long, where we dig into uh, some of the best art books around, we call it Art Book Study Group. If you'd like access to a uh, exclusive Patreon, where I mean, a, an exclusive uh, Discord server, where we share artwork, discuss tips, process, review each other's work, critique, feedback, support. And uh, if you'd like to read my comic books on a digital archive, you can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. That's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. -I. Links in the description to this video. If you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook, get work in progress animated gifts delivered right to your inbox. Um, get blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively. You can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. Also links in the, uh, in the description for the video. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on Kindle or Comixology, you can head on over to amazon.jeremy.net. That URL will forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a self-contained standalone story. It's a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. The writer, the artist, letterer, gray toner, do the whole thing. You can also pick up my most recent project, Morning Star. Morningstar tells the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven as a Western. It's an eight-issue comic book series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both of them have extensive back matter, character sketches, character designs, script excerpts, page layouts. Um, I show you examples of how I use photo reference to pull my pages together. Basically seeing the entire process. All of that at amazon.jeremy.net. And as I said, there's links in the description. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, there are links to all of these on my actual profile page. It's just not links in the individual video descriptions. And as I mentioned, um, the Art Book Study Group, we have a new session coming up this, uh, this coming Tuesday, two days from now. Um, the book we've been doing studies of is Walt Reed's The Figure. We're currently on the section on the, uh, the leg and foot, which is page... Uh, page 70 and 71. Anyway, if you'd like to participate in that, you can head on over and not only will we be able to catch that live stream in two days, but there's a whole archive of me doing, working my way through the entire book, doing master studies, as well as other books we've looked at, some uh, some George Bridgman, some Ken Holtgren animal drawing books, a bunch of uh, various others. You can catch all of that at patreon.com slash Jeremy. And so let's get into it. I see Byron's in the chat already. How you doing, Byron? How's it going? All right. Um, what are we doing today? Well, today's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge because we're, I'm still not done with the, uh, the Gorgon, Gorgon's lover painting. But I felt like just changing up the pace a little bit. So I had an idea since I've been doing all these Medusa pieces. This image just came to me of doing a Medusa, but doing it as a skull. So like the snakes are all skeletons, you know, the skull is there. And I just thought it's kind of a cool, edgy, uh, edgy idea. So I'm going to try and transform this piece into a, uh, into a t-shirt design. I don't know if this is necessarily something that's going to work as a print, but I do want to try it as a, as a t-shirt design. And we're going to start here with me just taking the image and I'm going to put it on a black background and I'm going to kind of cut away all of the pieces. Or actually, I may end up just redrawing this over the black background. I still haven't figured out exactly what my the best approach is for this because most of the t-shirts I do are, are black t-shirts that I sell on my site. I can do them in different colors. But what I want to do is make it so it's going to be – I want it to look visually good on a, uh, on a white t-shirt, which means obviously black skull – I mean white skull, white bones. But I don't know what that means for the line work. So I'm just going to kind of – Fumble my way through it, and you guys can hang out and watch while I do it, and we'll see what happens. 
Um, obviously, you guys know that I am not afraid of doing something that turns into a train wreck. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to – oops, I don't want that. Let me remove this. I want to copy and paste. And then I actually want to get rid of the other – Part of the sketch that's in the back here. Let's see. Do it. Um, Maitre says uh, hi, Jeremy. Um, apologies for my, my horrible pronunciation. I I really bad with uh, with French. I actually don't have any French at all. I've been to Paris. Um, all I had was a phrase book to kind of get me through. Um, you know, ordering food and and asking for directions, that sort of thing. But I've never actually studied any French, so I have no French at all. I, I apologize for the butchering the, the pronunciation. But but welcome. Thank you for joining us for the live stream. Let's see here. Byron says it sounds like fun. <laughs> he said, put tiny flames in the sockets. Let's go full metal. <laughs> it's a train wreck to 70% of the fun of being an artist. All truths. All truths. Hang on, let me turn my snaps off. I mean, honestly, it's not just that, that train wrecks are 70% of the fun of being an artist. I think that train wrecks are how we, we grow. Um, you know, just, just diving into something, getting in over our heads, and having to work our way out of a disaster. So let's say that I'm going to change the background color to black and let's start lowering the opacity in fact here's an interesting idea i have been uh, experimenting with one of the other things that i was going to show you later today like this is again it's a whole jumble but one of the things that i've been doing with that medusa piece the the medusa's lover the gorgon's lover piece is that i have uh I've been taking classes online with a Bobby Chu schoolism um, program. And there's a class. I took a class that's an intro to Procreate. And, yeah, I've been using Procreate for a number of years now. But much in the same way with figure drawing, I'm always obsessed with going back to the fundamentals, basic volumes, basic structures, and trying to improve that. I thought it would be interesting, since no one ever really taught me Procreate, I just – watched a bunch of YouTube videos and um, read some, you know, some blog posts and some stuff from the, the actual Procreate instruction manual, I thought it would be interesting to see how someone who teaches a course on Procreate, how they use it. I've already learned some, some new tricks. And I think I'm going to try the approach of one of these new tricks for doing this piece. Not sure how far I should drop the opacity on this. Drop it maybe down to 10. Anyway, one of the things that I personally have never been great at is the silhouette method of illustration, where you start with the whole silhouette and you sort of draw into it. But um, there's an artist, um, um, Nico Locker, um, Nikolai Lockenstern. And he teaches the uh, the intro to Procreate class. And in doing that, just working through the exercises where the the silhouette approach is what he uses for a lot of his work, or kind of a combination between silhouette and, and figure drawing. And I just, I don't know, there was something about being pushed and challenged to try and do this in a different way that... It inspired me. It challenged me. I think I came away from it being able to do more in this style than I've been able to do in the past. So I think I'm going to try a little bit of that process here. I should probably drop this layer underneath so I don't cover up the, the sketch as I go. But the main process here is 
just block in a simple silhouette. And I should start with the skull, really, if I'm going to do this process. Blocking in a simple silhouette of your figure, whatever it is that you're drawing. And then building the details out inside of it. And along the way, um, he frequently definitely encouraged people to adjust their silhouettes. You may come in and think that you've got a silhouette locked down exactly the way you want it. And then as you still go in and start putting some line work, you're like, oh, wait, I need to move this shoulder higher or lower. This eye socket doesn't line up with the other. So he's very encouraging of adjusting your process as you go. And I think I'm going to try that here and just see what happens. Let's see here. <laughs> yeah, Byron says uh, the same. The silhouette method is Greek to me. Well, you know, I've seen the silhouette method done very, very well by a lot of artists. Um, there's a really great book that I actually have in my, uh, my work bag. And I have it because I'm going to be doing some character designs for my next comic. And I wanted to try and re revisit that silhouette approach for, uh, for doing the character designs. It, the book is The Skillful Huntsman. And it's published by Scott Robertson's Design Studio Press. And it's a collaboration between Scott Robertson, who he's a, if you don't know, he's a teacher at a, Art Center in Pasadena, California. Um, he's notable for doing a lot of great vehicle design. Um, vehicle design for, uh, for film and TV, and he teaches that program at Art Center. But he also teaches a lot of not just vehicle design, but just film design in general and concept design. The, the book is a collaboration between him and a group of his students who have also gone on to, you know, do a lot of great work in the concept design film area. The It's sort of like him, the book is like a course. It's like him actually showing you the program that he would put a bunch of students through where he gives them uh, a story to work on. And then they design all of the characters, all the vehicles, all the environments. And the beauty of it is that it's four different artists doing it. And Robertson's giving his feedback in the book. However, the work, you get to see how four different artists would, um, would break down this particular story. And it's the story of the, the Skillful Huntsman, which is a, uh, I believe it's not uh, Hans Christian Andersen. Who did the other ones? The Brothers Grimm. I believe it's a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Mostly I look at the book. I... I read through it all the first time I got it, but nowadays when I look at it, I just look for, uh, I'm just looking for visual inspiration. So I don't remember all of the, the text details because this is one of those where the picture really speaks volumes. The pictures in that book are definitely worth a thousand words. But they do a lot of um, silhouette design in that book. So that's probably one of the, the best examples I've seen of silhouette design in the time that I've been trying to sort of suss it out and understand it myself. But yeah, the, the main thing is that I understand it as a principle. Like you just draw a silhouette of a figure before you draw the figure. Instead of starting with a, a gesture and an outline, you kind of just build the figure from the outside in. Um, it's antithetical to all of the figure drawing study that I've done over the course of my life. But having seen the results in, um, in the Lockerston class, the Nico Lockerston, the schoolism class that I just recently took, um, I think that like anything else, you try it the first time, you're not good at it. You try it the second time, you're not good at it. 
Um, revisiting it now for some reason in this class, it seemed to uh, to speak to me a little bit. So we're trying it out here and we'll see how it goes. And I think the, the thing I'm really questioning over here is how many snake heads to add. Whoa, must've been a break in that one. Yeah, didn't close this completely. Let's see here. Jay King is in the chat, says what's good brother and people. Um, it is all good. We're doing some uh, some new Medusa stuff. I'm still not done with that one painting, but I just felt the need to change pace and do something a little bit different. Let's see here. For me, for a lot of these, when I'm, you know, I think it's true whether I'm doing a gesture or I'm doing something like a, like a silhouette method, which is trying to find that rhythm that works for the pieces. And when it comes to the Medusas in particular, it's finding the right number of snakes and positioning the heads in a way so that it leads the eye through the piece, but doesn't get cluttered. So I've sort of got one, two, three, four, five, six, and I added one more right now for seven. We'll see how this looks and whether I need to add any more or whether I need to remove this one. Probably go a little bigger with this brush. Yeah, so right now I'm just trying to find a rhythm to lead the eye through these and I probably should turn these around and even though I have a brush that I can turn the smoothing on I prefer to just have sort of the uh, the natural wobble of my hand but I get like a nicer arc when I rotate it's the same way I would do if I were inking traditionally but just rotating the uh, the canvas around so I can just move through the, the natural flow of my my arm you know, that's another thing I've noticed. Oh, Drawing on the tablet, you end up using your wrist a lot more as opposed to your whole arm. And I noticed the other day, I was just randomly thinking about it. I'm like, huh, I know that it's bad to zoom in on your artwork in the sense that you end up putting in a lot of unnecessary detail. However, I want to erase that. However, zooming in when you're drawing larger on the tablet, it does give you space to use your arm more and actually, you know, Drawing from your shoulder is something that when you're drawing traditionally, you're always encouraged to do because you get a smoother rhythm and it's better for your body ergonomically 
And believe it or not, it feels awkward at first if you're kind of using your shoulder to control everything. But what happens is, as opposed to you just getting the pivot point of your wrist, you're getting the movement of your arm, you're getting subtle adjustments from your elbow, and then you're getting subtle refinements from your wrist. So it's almost as if you're turning up the resolution. Like one resolution is just drawing from your, your wrist coming here and there. But then having these extra two points, it's like going from a tablet that has like a certain level of sensitivity to like thousands more. Let's see. Let's see. Leo says, uh, thanks for the, the book recommendation. He says, I'm actually doing a short comic adaptation uh, of, coincidentally, also a Grimm's fairy tale. So I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, yeah, it's a, a fantastic book. Um, I think it's one of the best books on concept design. Just in the fact of seeing multiple people working out a problem, you know, it's not like they're telling you you have to do it one way because even the students themselves, all taking uh, that, that same class from the same instructor, have different approaches to solving character design, um, vehicle design, environment design, and even the way that they do silhouettes. I think out of the four students, three of them do silhouettes and one of them doesn't. Just um, I, I might be misremembering, but I think one of the students was like, nah, it's not my bag. Um, but just seeing the way that different people approach silhouette design for characters is uh, is very interesting. I will tell you that one thing that I have not found is a brush that gives me a nice, there's a certain feel that the sketch that I originally did that I'm drawing on top of, I drew with a brush pen. And I have used the Procreate brush pen and it definitely does not feel like a traditional brush pen. Which of course goes back to the, the, the ongoing question or struggle if you're really so concerned about making your work, your digital work look like traditional, then why don't you just work traditional? Um, this is one of the things that makes me wish, I make me say, hey, maybe I do need to get back into doing more traditional work. I mean, my intent was never to completely abandon traditional work, just to uh, lean into it in this particular phase because of the, the speed it gives me in terms of editing work. But you know, like you, you saw, I'm drawing on top of a uh, traditional sketch, so. I think there's definitely a place for starting out traditional, then moving into digital, then maybe even back and forth. Like with the, uh, the final, the last few issues of Morningstar, I was drawing everything digital except for the actual final inks so i was doing well no no i was doing my thumbnails traditionally with a um with a brush then i was doing layouts digital then printing those out inking traditional and scan them back in for the gray tones I am a, a big fan of the, the comic book and artist and illustrator Ashley Wood, and he is somebody who very much will go back and forth in terms of digital, traditional, digital. You know, it all just kind of blurs together. And I haven't reached that point yet, but uh, I might get there. You know, I need to change this so that it goes right into the side of the cheekbone. It's not quite a tangent, but it's a little bit off. It's off enough that it bothers me. This again falls into that whole thing I was talking about in terms of finding the rhythm of the flow of the snakes. And I'm just doing these with just simple lines now building their bodies out since i'm going to add all of the bones
You know, I really should actually get some reference for uh, for a snake skeleton. Let me see. I didn't think about this before I started, but now that I'm drawing it, I'm wondering if I can pull down some reference real quick to look at. Let me see here. Ooh, these are creepy. There are a couple of snake skeletons that are on uh, Wikimedia. Let me grab these guys. All right. Apologies for the delay, but uh, as I have found from recent history, when it comes to reference, I should just go get the reference once I, I have an idea of what I'm doing, as opposed to waiting and struggling. Well, actually, you know what? That isn't necessarily true. What I have found is that reference is best when uh, you grab it when you need it. So if you're drawing and everything is coming out fine, then maybe don't worry about reference. Okay. Let's see here. So we've got this one and this one. And I will tell you that the snake bones are thinner than I imagined. These definitely look creepy. Well, I will tell you already just from looking at uh, looking at these skeletons that I feel like I am probably going to deviate from them in the sense that the, the ribs are much thinner than I personally want to draw them. Like in real life, the real skeleton, the ribs are very thin. And I think for me, going back to, uh, let me duplicate this, I'm gonna have to eventually get rid of this layer because I'm working at a large enough print size that it is probably going to be, I'm gonna have to, I only have like 16 layers in this file. So let me take this sketch at full opacity and put that up in the corner there. Some reference. But as you can see from the, uh, the sketch that I have, I drew the ribs much thicker than the spine. And I feel like for me, visually, that's kind of kind of resonates. I don't know if uh, I'm gonna want to draw them visually accurately. Maybe I will try going with a thicker spine first and just see where that takes me in terms of doing the, the, the ribs. 
got to be open to uh, to try and step out. Because otherwise, if you're just going to follow a formula and just go da 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 da, da just step by step by step, you know, it, it's good to have a process, but you can take it overboard. And I think I'm going to try something different. I was going to try and have this serpent kind of sideways and just looking like more of a a head-on shot as opposed to looking down at its head. But I think instead what this last one might need is an open mouth. So let me add serpents and let me switch this to that side since i'm right-handed it's better for me to have my drawing now it's weird you've got my head you've got the reference and you've got the sketch i'm working a whole bunch of stuff going on in uh in one image That's enough there. Just need to be able to kind of see the reference. Um, yeah, I think that I'm going to try having this one's mouth open. Only problem is you can't really tell where the front fangs are. I think I'm going to try and have the head come underneath and then behind that way. Before I get too caught up, so I'll tell you, um, Byron, I remember you. Like specifically when you you made the comment that the the silhouette method was like Greek to you, this is I think right here where I've tried the silhouette method in the past, and I would get to the the stage where I'm like okay I've sort of blocked my figure in and I would just look at it and be like all right this doesn't look as good as when I construct a figure and that's why I would say all right this method doesn't work for me, and what I learned in the class is the same way that I will work thumbnails and just redraw and redraw is that at this stage of the, the silhouette, you just like any other piece, when you're doing a, a thumbnail or you're doing the, the rough stage, you know, there's a point where, you know, we talk about the ugly stage of an illustration where things just aren't working, but you, you're not done, but you're in too deep. Like the idea is solid, but the execution is crap at the moment and i think that what is challenging and what isn't it isn't true for every piece but i think for a lot of artwork i'm starting to realize that there are multiple ugly stages there's an ugly thumbnail stage there's an ugly sketch stage there's an ugly like anatomy or composition stage there's an ugly definitely an ugly silhouette stage um an ugly inking stage if you're doing ink work, um, ugly block-ins, ugly color stage, and then eventually you get to your, your piece kind of leaps 
limps its way across the finish line, and then you're like, oh, that's not so bad. And depending on the piece, there may be only one of those, or it may be that every single stage is a struggle. Some pieces are like that. But I realized that this, this ugly silhouette stage is worth fighting through, and then if I do, I can actually get some decent results. In fact, if you guys are okay with it, I will show you some, uh, some sketches that I did. I'll stop this for a moment and show you some recent sketches I did just trying to experiment with the process from the class. So let me see here. We'll come back to uh, our skeletal friend here. Let me see, where is my digital sketchbook? Here we go. So here's a couple of pieces I did. I've got a barbarian and then I've got like an armored robot samurai. And I did the same character, but I tried two different approaches with her. And one approach was after I did my silhouette to block in the shadows first and then add the highlights, and that's the one on the left. And then the one on the right, I drew in the highlights first and then blocked in the shadows. And I think I went a bit too dark with the shadows. Like I kind of treated them a little bit too much like line work. Um, the one on the right feels a little bit more like one of my traditional illustrations and less painterly, whereas the one on the, the left, there's less contrast, but it feels more sculpted. And actually, I think if anything, that's probably more of a direction I should lean into. But for all three of these, what I did was I started with just drawing a silhouette and then adjusting, sculpting, moving stuff around, and then adding in a new layer of lighting or shadow and, you know, just building it out. And they actually didn't feel horrible to me like the way they normally did. And part of that is that I treated the um... <laughs> Byron. <laughs> Byron said, "So what you're saying is my art is ugly." What I'm saying is that everyone's art is ugly. <laughs> We're all in it together, bro. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, and I'm not again. This silhouette method is new for me, and it's always challenging when you find a new toy and you want to just dive deep in, because I have a process for constructing. You've seen me doing figure construction for all of the time I've been doing comics that I, uh, that I usually approach. It's the, the style that I was using for sketching out the, uh, the most recent Medusa piece when I was doing, redoing it in line art to work out details. Um, I'm still learning this phase, but what I'm really learning to do is to treat the silhouette the same way I treat a gesture drawing. Um, the same way that I would start, let me go back to uh, the current piece. Where are we at? Okay. The same way, if I were to move over here to in the corner and do a little scribble, the same way that if I were drawing a figure, I would start with... Um, Let's say I was drawing Superman, and I would start with, uh, let me make this a little bit slimmer. The same way I would start, you know what? I need an, a fresh, let me turn these off and just do a fresh layer. <laughs> I don't want to draw all of that and then have to erase it. This way I can just delete the layer when I'm done. Um, let's say I were drawing Superman. Drop the opacity on this a little bit. My traditional method I would sort of say, all right, that's going to be, that's too small. It's going to be like the height of the whole figure. See, here's the midpoint. Construct the head, you know, simple head, broad shoulders, kind of separate the, uh, the upper torso from the lower torso.
stick figure hands, stick figure legs. And then from here, I would go in and volume each of those things out. So I would either a barrel cylinder, a block, an egg shape, same thing for the uh, lower torso. Cylinders for the legs. Cylinders for the lower leg. Wedges for the feet. Upper arm, lots of cylinders, upper arm cylinder. In fact, I think I can move the opacity up on this at this point. Cylinder, cylinder, cylinder. Maybe a box for the fist. Depending on the pose, maybe a box, maybe a an egg shape. Deltoids. And maybe just have his cape go up and sweep off to the side, up. You know, and from here, I would just tighten everything. So this has all of the building blocks I need to draw the character. Then it's just putting in the, the detail, the anatomy. So, you know, I would go from that simple stick figure gesture to, to blocking everything out. And the difference between this and the silhouette method is that with the silhouette, let me shrink this down slightly so I've got room to draw next to it. Um, <clears throat> The silhouette, it's the same thing, except you know, you're working in outline, which they, they will, you know, it's not like you're not allowed to use measurement marks for proportion. But you're really thinking as opposed to thinking from the, the figure inside out. You're working outside in. And you're thinking more in terms of two-dimensional shapes, which isn't necessarily that different. From what I'm doing with the, the first method. I should probably turn the opacity all the way up because I'm gonna need to fill all of this in, make sure there's no gaps. So the main thing with the silhouette method is once you get your figure all blocked in, and I'm going to leave the cape off because, yeah, the cape would be problematic for the silhouette method. But hey, I'm just still figuring this out, so I don't have all the answers yet. <clears throat> but once you block all this in, this would be the equivalent of the stick figure that I made before I started putting in the volumes. And this would also be this stage at which I would normally just say, eh, I don't like this method. But what you start doing at this stage is the same way that I would go in and change that arm to a cylinder. In the silhouette method, I would go in and start tweaking the silhouette. So then it's just a matter of taking the eraser and say, all right, I'm going to cut in for... Uh, for sort of the, uh, not the lats, the external obliques. So I can get that cut from the external obliques to where they go into the uh, the pelvis. You wanna cut in and then back out again. 
you might say, all right, I do want to have strong shoulders, but I want to have a little bit more separation between the, uh, the head and the neck. So you might come in here and say, all right, let me sculpt that. Let me actually give the definition of like the eye shape, shape his hair a little bit. And this is the thing that I never really understood about the process. I thought you just drew the silhouette and either you drew it well or you didn't. But it's very similar to drawing, you know, working in just out, working construct, work in terms of constructing the figure. Where you draw the silhouette and then you refine the silhouette. You know, this shoulder... The shape needs to not go up as much as I had it, but it needs to go out a little bit more and then down. Maybe it goes down further than I have it. Maybe I come in here and I want to have the, the bicep come in a little bit more to give you that, that shift between the bicep and then the forearm. And I think that this part is actually particularly tricky because you kind of actually have to know not a ton of anatomy, but you have to have a decent sense of the major muscles in order to understand why you're cutting in on one part place and out on another. Um, that's hard to do. I will tell you that I don't think I – that's probably the reason why I never liked the silhouette method before because I don't think I knew enough anatomy to be able to effectively do this part. And if I'm wholly honest, I wouldn't say that I'm like, oh, wow, I know so much anatomy that I can just knock this out and make everything right. I think that it's still, I think I've got enough that I can, I know enough that I can get myself in trouble. And I'm going to kind of bring this barrel chest in a bit more because I think that that actually by having his waist be narrower really emphasizes how broad his chest is. I mean, I do like the way Bruce Tim kind of draws his Superman and his Batman like a tank. But yeah, at this point, the, the, the difference, I'm not going to go through the entire figure because we're already like 48 minutes in, and I've jumped around from silhouette shape design, serpents to silhouette shape design, to assignments from other... Uh... Actually, you know what? Screw it. This is, I think, interesting enough that it's worth me drawing it out, and then I can just come back to uh, my Medusa piece that I was working on, the, uh, the skeleton head, with whatever time we have left. But I think it's worth it because, like I said, I'm learning this process from the, uh, the class that I'm taking. So me doing these studies right now is actually me reinforcing what I've recently learned. But as you can see, if I were continuing with the, the constructed sketch that I did on the left, I would go in and I would be refining these muscles in the exact same way. This isn't a one, I've discovered the way and I've abandoned constructing figures. Um, but I can see now in a way I didn't see before how it's a matter of refining this silhouette until it both feels right and feels anatomically sound. Because you can draw, the same way you can draw, you know, when constructing the figure, you can draw something that looks anatomically correct, but it just feels boring as shit. Um,
with this, you want the anatomy to feel reasonable, but you also want the drawing to, to feel like it's got some energy to it, some rhythm. I think if I were doing this as a painting, what I would probably do is just draw the cape as a separate shape completely, like on a separate layer. But you know what's interesting is seeing how something like a cape affects a character. Because when you draw, say, Batman, Batman works as a giant wedge with like the head and the pointy ears on top. Like all you need is to put the, the pointy ears on the top and a big mass, you'll say, oh, that's Batman. You know, when you have Superman, yes, the cape is endemic and part of him, but that's an interesting question. How do you make the rest of him read if his silhouette is somewhat covered up by the cape? And I think just this discussion that we're having here is enough to make me want to put a cape on this guy just to see how it looks. Because maybe that's an important lesson is, okay, how do you construct a silhouette of someone wearing a cape? And this is also something where as I'm drawing this, I'm feeling like I want to... Move the forearm up a bit. Deviate from the, the silhouette that I, I already sketched in so far. And that's another thing that I didn't understand. I thought, oh, once you start doing the silhouette, you're kind of stuck with it. But no, you're kind of supposed to. And this is what's wild. One of the things that... Uh, that I have never really done is I don't, I rarely use clipping masks in my art. I will use layer masks where it's like a separate thing that you're, you're painting on top of, but the clipping mask is where it references the layer beneath it becomes the, the layer beneath it is just a normal drawn layer and it has, you know, whatever it is you drew on it, but a clipping mask will use that layer the boundaries of that layer as the um, as the mask. And that made me think, well, the reason why that's so mind-blowing is because, one, I've never really liked using clipping masks before, but now that I've tried it with this method, it actually seems to work pretty well. But the other thing, too, is that... <clears throat> I thought, well, once you have blocked in your silhouette, then you're really locked into your decisions. You know, that's when you've decided this is the, the shape, this is the pose. I guess I better stick with it and not change anything. And I was wrong about that too. Um, Nico Lockenstern definitely encourages, it, encourages people at every phase to go ahead and revise and edit. And when you're using the clipping mask, when you're using the layer underneath this, the clipping mask, that means all you need to do is you just go down to your base layer, your base silhouette. And if you decide, oh, I want this pose to, I want to move this limb up, higher, lower, whatever, if you've got rendering on top of it. If you've got lighting on top, shadow on top, as you erase the silhouette and move a limb, the, uh, the parts that are drawn on other parts of the figure are just hidden. You know, you just you drew, you, you move it, and uh, and now those uh, the, the lines you made before are, are hidden, although maybe some stray marks that you had somewhere else may be revealed, and you may have to, to paint over those, but you're going to have to repaint those highlights and shadows anyway. Um, I'm trying to get a very subtle thing here, which is sort of a rounded bump, but then have it come back in. and flow into the rest of that form. 
I'm making this forearm too bulky, but what I want is to get an angle and then a, a sharp direction change as this moves in here. As it kind of wedges into the, uh, the actual part between the, the upper forearm and the wrist. Just trying to get that wedge in there. So what I was saying before about, I'm not, I don't really need to get into, well, sure, I might as well, if I'm going this far, I might as well fix the feet too. Yeah, this episode was definitely a, a hodgepodge because I have jumped all over the place. Do you know what? That happens sometimes. And I'm trying to be more willing to just let the process take us wherever it takes us as opposed to be like, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to stick with that one thing. I'm trying to be more open, more fluid, more flexible. So, like I said, um, the cape, not knowing how it would affect this, what I am likely to do is add another layer and then in this new layer, I would try to maybe sculpt in a cape design and I'm seeing now before and the, the one that I was drawing through the figure, I have the cape going, you know, covering most of his legs. In this version, now looking at it as a silhouette, maybe I really want to pull that cape. In more, as opposed to it being as broad as it is. Take this and connect with that. And hopefully there's no breaks in it. So I can just, yep. Whoa, there was a break in that one. Now see again, the same way that I went through and sculpted all of that detail on the body and kind of moved corners around, added more anatomy. This cape, the shape of it, the silhouette of it is very different from the one that I just roughed in on the, uh, the construction version. But as I can see now, it, may, it forced me to change the design of the cape to work with the figure better. Because I think that this still reads as Superman, even though that cape is covering up a big chunk of his torso. And I think that, and also there's different ways that I could go with it. I can, let's see, turn that off and um, another layer. I can do the cape up this way and I could put a loop to kind of halo his head. I know that his cape is normally a, not that the opening at the back of the neck would not be this large. But this is a case of taking a creative license. 
Let me grab the lasso, move this cylinder out of the, no, I don't want to do that. Move the cylinder out of the way over to that side because I want some room for this cape. Instead, I want to draw it so it's more. I started drawing it like it was going to be going straight up above. But I realized it reads better. If I let it go off, if I have it go back into the distance more. So let's fill this. Now true, that's a little bit of a cheat leaving that opening there. But we get the advantage now of his cape, you know, his body not being hidden. Point being is that now that I've been just one, just through the course of going through the class, I've been forced to work with something that I was not comfortable with. But two, the fact that I've, I've been given a chance to, to play with it and apply my own personal style to it, I have come around to really seeing, I mean, I always saw the benefits of the silhouette method in the fact that the people who did it well made it look dope. I just couldn't get wrap my brain around it. Like what you said, Byron, literally was exactly how I've always felt about this approach. It looks cool. I just, I can't wrap my head around it. And being forced to play with it and watch someone who does it well, seeing how they did it, it made me say, oh, okay. Now I've got a, a framework for how I can use this in illustrations. And I think going forward, like, I could not have done a piece like this thing that I just drew now. I couldn't have done that. Literally, even though I have the, the drawing and anatomy skills, I didn't have the mental framework for how to, con to conceive of a piece this way until getting to here, until taking that class. Um, the class I'm still taking, but uh, I'm, I've learned a ton from it. And I'll tell you one, one last thing. A lot of times, like, the next step in a phase like this, when you go in and you start blocking in your shadows, the way uh, Nico Lockenstern would do it is he would probably take the figure and merge the figure with this particular cape. Although when you've got a case like the, the previous one, this is one where you would probably leave them separate just because you would need to be able to do rendering on top to, to separate him from the cape. And in fact, let me do one more thing real quick before we call this a day. <laughs> Byron says, let's make a cool uh, Medusa t-shirt. 10 minutes later, <laughs> Superman. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I used to be super great at staying focused on one thing and just running it through the ground. You know, I'll tell you this, the reason why I, I wanted to change things up is specifically, <laughs> it's all part of the fun. Um, I wanted to change things up because I've been spending so much time doing that, uh, the Medusa Lover painting, and I've been drawing it, redrawing it, painting it, not liking the way the painting was coming out, that I felt like I wanted to just change things up for an episode so you didn't, you're not always doing that. So I was either going to do this or I was going to do a master study, just something to change change it up. Um, because actually I have, my mind was, look, I'm not done with the Medusa painting. I'm just going to keep working on it. But hopefully next week I'll, I'll have something that's closer to being finished, if not actually just finishing it during the week, because I've been using some of these painting tools for my new approach. Um, so the last thing I was going to show you is that clipping, um, that clipping mask method so I'm adding another layer, and 
You can change this. You can make it an alpha lock so you can't paint on transparent pixels. You can make a mask that you would normally use where you paint on it and whatever is below is masked out. Or you can use the clipping mask. <clears throat> and in this, I'm going to take a, a color. So I've been working in white. Let's just go down two values. So let's say I'm going to paint in shadows on this, this Superman or just block in a shadow side of the figure. Um, if I turn off that cape, so go bigger here. Let's just say he's being lit from the left, so the shadows are all on the right side. So what's happening here is that every, every line is being masked by the, by the silhouette underneath. It is being clipped to that silhouette. For instance, if I turn off the clipping mask, hang on. You just get a little bit more in here. And this is another one of those things where you start out rough and you just build in detail. I'm sorry, I realize I'm drawing super zoomed out, so you guys really can't see what I'm doing. So I'm zooming in a little bit more just to give you guys a better view. But anyway, if I were to unclip this, you can see that all of those marks go out beyond the, um, the silhouette. It's just the mask, the clipping mask, cuts them to the figure. So I can just kind of go in here and scribble de do. get crazy with it and not have to worry too much about staying precise. And if I turn that cape back on, well, the cape is above, so I need to put the cape behind the figure. But now you see how this clipping map becomes very handy for uh, helping to define the figure. And to be honest, what I can do is just create a separate clipping mask for the cape so I can paint shadows onto the cape as well. In fact, let's do that. Let's give the, the cape its own clipping mask. But um, in the method that I, I did, not method, but in the, the first one that I drew, not the first one, the second one that I drew where the, the cape is above the figure, in that case, it would probably be wise to um, go ahead and just merge both the line art, the, the cape silhouette and the figure silhouette. Now I can put 
I don't want to go overkill here because now the cape is becoming the uh, the prime attraction. I just want to put enough detail in here to separate him from the uh, Although I will tell you that my instinct is to put lines in here to help make him pop. But I actually kind of like the fact that there's this open space in the middle where if you were coloring this as a comic, then they would be separated by color. But value-wise, it's kind of like it helps unite the whole silhouette instead of breaking it up. Like all of these lines towards the outside are serving the function of breaking up the um, the figure from the the cape breaking up the so that the two silhouettes don't completely mesh together so you can identify the figure standing against it. However, the whole point of doing these, if I turn off these two clipping masks, again, that whole point of doing a, a silhouette in the first place is that you want the silhouette to kind of unite the figure as a whole as a whole shape. So to me, leaving breaks where, because even that, like leaving the silhouette just, even the, um, the shadows just on the cape, but letting the figure have no shadow on them, even that, it still makes the, makes the figure pop. And the point is that you want to have that balance of being able to identify the parts within the figure while at the same time, still having that strong silhouette read. And I have to tell you that compared to the constructive one I did, the constructive one, the problem is the silhouette, the pose is exactly the same. But if you were to look at the silhouette of all of this, hell, let me just draw one more layer before we call it a day. And if I were to just very quickly go in here in white, and it's going to look crappy because I'm not doing all the refinement that I did to the silhouette in the first place. And you know, why do I still have the snake up there? We don't need the snake. We're not doing snake anymore. We're just doing this. Get the reference out of the way. I make the image bigger. I just <laughs> completely forgot about that. All right. Um, but my point being is that if I just make the silhouette of the original sketch that I did. And it's gonna look worse because I didn't, I'm not taking the time to refine this silhouette. But I think the point that I'm gonna make is gonna stand out regardless of whether I refine the silhouette or not. And the point is, is without taking that time to work that silhouette, this version is going to come out almost incomprehensible. So if you were reading this in a comic, and I was drawing Superman in a, in a comic, you would read from the line art, oh, yeah, that's Superman. And yeah, he's in a classic pose. But... The silhouette of the cape, the silhouette of the figure, it's like it's not going to read the way you really want a silhouette to read. See, if you compare these, remember what I mentioned earlier about how you throw Batman's ears on anything, it'll kind of read as Batman? This doesn't read as Superman at all. You could throw some ears on there and call it Batman. They give him Tim Sale style Batman ears. We unfortunately lost Tim Sale a couple weeks ago. I just finished reading a Dark Victory, the uh, the, the sequel to Long Halloween, Halloween, because I wanted to read some more of his work, and I had never read that story before. Anyway, um. Yeah, the boots don't really. And also the fact that this pose doesn't really go with Batman per se. 
But my point here is that you lose, if I turn off the Kate detail, if I turn these off, comparing these, and I know, all right, let me, let me get rid of those ears. Just so you can have the comparison of the two silhouettes. They are both a guy in a cape. And it's the same pose. But one, I think, very much still reads as Superman. The one on the right. Whereas the one on the left is just sort of like, maybe it's the Phantom of the Opera. Maybe it's somebody at like a, a fashion runway show. He's wearing a cape costume. Maybe somebody at a masquerade ball. Um, I think that is where the power of silhouette design is really starting to click home with me. I know that it's a very powerful tool. I was never able to understand how to make it work. But hopefully, you know, I'm sharing how the light bulb went off for me over this past week. And maybe watching me do this We'll maybe, maybe make you guys want to play with it a little bit too. And if it's not in your toolbox, you're like, oh, wait, I think I kind of get it now. Because, yeah, just playing with it, playing with an ugly silhouette and refining it into a, a strong one, that's where the real magic happens. All right, guys. Thank you again for hanging out, um, for joining me for, uh, for this uh, – this new session, and hopefully it was enlightening, somewhat educational, informative, entertaining. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to even more of this, you want to do a deep dive into uh, figure construction and, uh, and fundamentals of drawing, we're doing that deep dive this Tuesday. It's going to be 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, it's called, we're doing, a, it's called Art Book Study Group, and it's something we do on Patreon. We've been studying Walt Reed's The Figure. So if you happen to have this book, um, great. If not, you can draw along for the images that I'm going to be having on screen while I'm drawing. But I definitely recommend it as one of the best books on drawing fundamentals. And we've just been doing deep dive studies of that. So you can get on board with that at, uh, at patreon.com slash Jeremy. That's, uh, that's patreon.com slash G-E-R. I am I. Um, if you don't make it in time for this Tuesday session, sign up whenever. There's probably well over 100 videos at this point of our book study group. Um, it's definitely more than 100 hours of video. I don't know how many actual individual videos there are. But for as little as $2 a month, you can get uh, access to the entire back archive of them. They're all up there on Patreon. If you just go in there, you go through the tag our book study group, you can see all of the previous videos that we've done. Um, you also, again, you'll have access to our Patreon exclusive Discord server where we share artwork, give each other feedback, encouragement, talk process, art tools, and just, you know, generally clown around, have some fun, uh, just beyond the live stream. Uh, you get access to that. Uh, if you haven't read any of my comp books yet, you can read them in a digital archive on Patreon, all that for $2 a month. There are additional tiers for, for higher rewards. And, um, and if you just want to, support the channel greatly appreciate it down over to patreon.com slash g-e-r-i-m-i -I, links in the description for the video um if you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook get work in progress and any gifts delivered right to your inbox blog post about what i'm reading what i'm watching what's uh what's inspiring me creatively you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net and if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. They'll forge you to my Amazon author page. You pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It's a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my, uh, my most recent project, Morningstar. It is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. Uh, it's an eight-issue series, volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both of them have extensive back matter, character sketches, character designs, um, page layouts, thumbnails, um, photo reference, and examples of how I use photo reference in my comic book pages. Uh, all that and more at amazon.jeremy.net. Um, 
If you're watching on Twitch, there aren't descriptions in the uh, on the video, but there's just um, links on my homepage, and you can head on over there and and check all everything out: the newsletter, the Patreon, the books. Uh, again, everyone, thank you for for dropping in. Hope you guys for, for those in the U.S. I hope you have a happy Fourth of July and you have a safe one. Don't blow your fingers off with any fireworks. Um, I hope that your pets aren't too freaked out by the noise and the explosions. Uh, our cats are not fond of it, so it's a little, little crazy. But anyway, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. If you are subscribed and if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button. Hit that notification bell so you get notifications next time we go live. Thank you all. That's it for now. Go be creative.